Welcome students, welcome everyone. <clears throat> and I, once again, back with another interesting, important topic of chemistry, that's chemical reactions. And that's basically the primary, one of the important, and one of the, the most primary topic of the chemistry, of the, of the, of the chemical sections, rather, the chemical world. So chemical world, <clears throat> without chemical reactions, or without reactions, are considered to be almost impossible. So, this particular topic, chemical reactions, are always and the most important part of chemistry. So, before we, so we will definitely proceed with this topic, chemical reactions, and before we proceed, we are going to definitely figure it out, that how we are going to proceed with this. We will proceed that with chemical reaction, the primary most important thing, that is, how the reactions go on. And what are the different types of reactions and how the reactions go on, goes on. So if there are any criteria for a reaction to carry on, and if there, and if there are criteria, what are those criteria and all the stuff? And what are the different, and those criteria and the stuff, whether they were applicable, whether they were applicable on any of the different types of chemical reactions which are present or not. So we are going to proceed with like that way. Now, the proceedings definitely, uh, since our proceeding will be that of condition of definitely of chemical reaction, is that we need to focus on the reactants. We know that. We need to focus on the reactants. And for every reactant, the very first and the primary important thing is that other reactants are reactive. Because since they are focusing on the chemical reactions, we will definitely expect that there should be some outcome, a product formed. So, a product was only formed and will be formed if two substances, when they would react. But if they do not react, then the outcome will be nothing. So based on this perspective, we need to consider that if we need to consider the reactiveness, that how the reactive or rather uh, the activity of a particular element works. And in order to discuss this, we will today begin with our very important topic and a headline of today's chemical reaction, the chemical world, that is metal activity series. This metal activity series is very, very important when we are discussing or focusing on chemical reactions. That's very important. So first, definitely, as I always say, that whenever we will come across and encounter any sort of new word or new term, we will first try to identify, we will first try to understand the meaning of that word. What is metal activity series? What is that? We will first identify, we will understand this first. So metal activity series, by this word, activity, we actually focus on how much active, in simple words, how much active a particular substance is. This activity is given over there. So we will definitely focus on how much active how much enthusiastic, how much random, how much eager. There are different words we actually are there to, uh, to apply. That is, how much active a particular substance is. In active in terms of what? In terms of reacting, interacting with other substances. So how much active a particular substance is, this is. There is a, this sentence has been stopped over here. Because we need to understand that how much particular active a particular substance is means active in terms of reactiveness and active in terms of excitement to interact with other substances. So when it's term for metals or non-metals, over here it's written, I have mentioned over here as metals, but over here I uh, though I have mentioned metals. But it would have been much better if I, uh, if you, if you can write elements. So for elements, how much reactive a particular substance is? Now, why I have mentioned over here metal because since the name itself says metal activity series, for that reason I mentioned over here specified over here is metals. Now over here I'm not mentioning the name is it does not suggest as elemental or element activity series. It highlights as metal activity series, and for that reason, it's mentioned as for metals, how much reactive the particular metal is, and reactive towards other substances. 
So if I need to compile and if I need to put on and pen down certain uh, this definition or the uh, description of the metal activity series, so I will definitely go by this. That is, it's a sequential arrangement of metal ions, or metal atoms, rather. Not metal ions, but metal atoms, in accordance to the reactivity in a descending order. Descending order, that is, the metal which is most reactive is placed at the top of the series, while the least reactive metal is placed at the bottom of the series. So if you check out the reactivity table that's given over there, the reactivity table is given over there, that is, it shows the reactivity decreases. The arrow sign downwards, it shows the reactivity decreases, and gradually decreases. So the most reactive element is placed at the top, that is potassium, and the least reactive element is placed at the bottom, that's platinum. And there is, as is highlighted, one element over there is highlighted, that's hydrogen. So, according to the series, potassium is most reactive, and platinum is the least reactive element. Or rather, I just remember, it's a better way of saying that potassium is the most reactive metal and platinum is the least reactive metal. Countering, there is another important uh, information from the table that is, exceptional in the series is hydrogen, being a non-metal, has been placed within this metal activity series. And now that's a very important point which we need to understand. That in the, the term itself says metal activity series, and if we go through them and from the starting, from the start to the end, we will definitely find elements that is potassium followed by sodium, calcium, and the end it's, it's, uh, we are having the gold and the platinum. Over there, we will definitely find elements. All the elements are metals, but the exception is there within this metal activity series. That is, it is having hydrogen. Hydrogen is basically a non-metal. Hydrogen, it is basically a non-metal. But the interesting part is it has been placed. It has been positioned within the metal activity series. It has been positioned. The question arises, why? The question arises, why? It has been placed in the metal activity series. The reason is, on occasions, hydrogen sometimes behaves as metals. Hydrogen sometimes behaves as metals. And hence, for that reason, it has been placed in the metal activity series. Now, the series also gives the information about which metal is capable of placing another metal from its compound to form a new compound. This particular metal activity series gives a, it's, it's a very vital and viable information which is very required and highly required whenever we are carrying out a chemical reaction, that is, which metal is reactive towards other substances. Let's give, take an example that if you're considering, if you're, if you're using silver, and we are, if you want that silver to react with copper sulfate solution, it will not react easily. If you want to react, if you want that silver will react with uh, maybe sodium chloride solution, silver will never react with sodium chloride solution. Because silver is very, very less reactive than sodium. And it is not capable, as for the metal activity series, sodium is not capable of replacing, of replacing sodium sorry, silver is not capable of replacing sodium from its compound, sodium chloride, in order to form silver chloride, it will never form. It will never form. So, this particular information about which metal is capable of replacing another metal from its compound to form a new compound, that's a very, very vital thing, which is, which is associated with metal activity series. This information is very important. For example, so as I said, so sodium metal is capable of replacing any metal ion from its compound, which is placed below a series. Sodium individual, the sodium metal, is capable of replacing any metal ion from its compound, which is placed below it in the metal activity series. Similarly, zinc is not capable of re replacing aluminium from its compound zinc, compound, since zinc is placed below aluminium. So zinc is not capable of replacing aluminium. I call it. So if you're if you're considering a reaction with Zn plus Zn plus AlCl3, and if I expect that I'll get ZnCl2, that's our wrong expectation because that reaction will never happen. Because zinc is less reactive than aluminium, and hence it's reacting or rather zinc if it reacts with an aqueous solution of aluminium chloride, 
So oh, no, there, nothing will happen. No reaction will form. It will take place. Now coming to our next topic, that is types of chemical reactions. And that's if we are since we are already discussed about our previous this metal activity theories, so we need to, now we will apply this concept while discussing about chemical reactions. The so types of chemical reactions, there are different types of chemical reactions, and we will start and we will have a look overview of the different types of chemical reaction a list a list out. The first, we are having combination reaction or synthesis reaction. The second, decomposition reaction. The third, displacement reaction or simple displacement reaction. The fourth, double displacement reaction. Or it's also called double decomposition reaction. Exothermic reaction, endothermic reaction. This is not the end, basically. This is not the end that uh, sodium, uh, this um, reactions, it, it ends at endothermic reaction. There are other reactions also, which will be discussed in this break or today only, but a bit later. We are having precipitation reactions, we are having neutralization reactions. So all these things will be discussed, but slightly bit later. So first we are going to discuss and we are going to start with all these, all these topics and we are going to start with combination reaction or synthesis reaction. All right? So, combination reaction or synthesis reaction. The word itself is combination reaction, that is, we know that uh, a reaction in which substances combine. That is, two substances, other reactants, substances over here means the reactants. The reactants will fuse, well, it's, it's a fuse, they will, they will combine, they will merge together. So, they will combine, they will merge together. Or you can see all the fuse, you know, they, will, they will fuse to form one product. So they will merge together. So one or the two substances or two reactants are there, or three reactants are there. So one or more, so minimum two or more multiple reactants are there. And they will combine all together to form one product. That is what you call as combination reaction. They will combine. So as you see, as you can see, there's when when two or more substances combine to form a single product, that's the definition. When two or more substances, that's the basic principle of this combination reaction. So when two or more substances combine to form a single product. And this is where the example goes. There's a formula given A reactant plus B, that's also reactant, and it'll form a one product. So we have taken two elements. Uh, in general, a reaction is given as an example. That is iron plus Sulfur to be in for sulfides. So iron will react with sulfur. So iron is an element, sulfur is also an element, two different elements that are combining together. So they will merge, they're merging together to form ferrous sulfide. Carbon monoxide with oxygen, it's forming carbon dioxide. It's merging. So carbon monoxide is merging with oxygen to form carbon monoxide. That's gas. So it's a it's a they're they're forming a single product. So it starts with a formula that's a plus b to give c that's a basically the general formula the structure of the combination reaction followed by two examples we'll now move on to our next exam next reaction type that's decomposition reaction okay now the word decomposition means it's a reaction where substances will break the kind of substance mean the chemical components, the reactants. So the reactants who are participating in a chemical reaction, in this particular type of reaction, it will break. So it will decompose. So decompose, the decomposition means it will, de it, it, anything which decomposes, it breaks. You're, you're very much familiar with this word, decompose in terms, in whenever you're, whenever you're reading biology, where there, the activity of bacteria, the bacterial activity or the viral activity or the, any sort of fungi, fungi or any, uh, any, any in the purchase, it's a vi mostly viral, and it breaks, it leads to decomposition, it breaks down. So decomposition means break, breaking down of substances into, into, breaking down into, it's much more simpler substances. So com compound or complex substances are breaking down into simpler substances, into fine substances. That's what you call as decomposition reactions. Okay. So here it goes, so when a substance or compound breaks or decomposes into two or more simpler substances by the application of energy. So there, there, there definitely this energy plays a vital role 
energy plays a vital role. It's uh, there are exceptions, but simply because, or no, it's not simply without any sort of energy supply, without any sort of energy supply, their reaction or the decomposition will not take place. And now the energy source, this energy source can be in terms of light. This energy source can be in terms of heat. It can be sound. It's kind of pressure, so etc. So these are different types, different ways of there can be the, the decomposition can be in terms of electricity also. So there are different ways, different types of, by which energies can be supplied to a particular chemical component and leading to the decomposition or breaking down of substances or reactants into much simpler and smaller substance. Now moving on, if I go with an example of this, that's a reactant plus energy given B product plus C product. That's a general structure of this particular decomposition reaction. So we are having potassium nitrate, which is giving potassium nitrate plus oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide is decomposed or breaks to give water plus oxygen. Now the question arises, I didn't mention over here about energy or anything else, I've simply written the air that's reacted, it's, it's matching over here, but we're on the structure of the energy structure, it's not given over here, on the following reactants over there. So the first, let me inform you, that all of you, that is, it's potassium nitrate, potassium nitrate, it gets decomposed in the presence of heat, that's temperature. So if I heat this particular substance in a chemical, in a chemical beaker or any other test tube or any other chemical apparatus, we will get potassium nitrite and oxygen gas. We are hydrogen peroxide is not a very stable compound. It's uh, as, and uh, from hence for that reason it's always stored in black bottles. Hydrogen peroxide it's a not a very stable compound. Even it is sensitive to light, and hence it's always stored in black bottles. So hydrogen peroxide plus light, hydrogen peroxide plus light gives gives water plus oxygen. So light is giving or supplying energy to hydrogen peroxide. Heat is supplying energy to potassium nitrate. And there was a list goes on. It, there are a lot, a lot of lists. There are others also, which is which is sensitive to heat, which is sensitive to light and sound also. Now our next reaction type will be displacement reaction or simple displacement reaction. The word itself suggests it's a clear meaning. That is displacement. That is one substance will displace another one. I'll take its position. One substance will displace another substance or another one and will take its position. That's what we call as displace. So the one which is more powerful, so always powerful is able to replace, or so not replace, rather displace. Powerful is able, is, is having the ability to displace the one which is having a little power. All right. So, when a more active substance displaces a less chemically active substance from its compound in order to form a new compound of its own, this is what a general statement is a statement describing simple displacement reaction or displacement reaction. Now, this reaction will be more clearer, the reaction will be more clearer when you're going to get this example. What's the example? A reactant, that's A reactant plus B C reactant, giving A C plus B. So, this A reactant is basically an element, an active substance, especially in an element. And the B C represents compound. It's not an element anymore. It has to be compound. Which is containing, and then we know that compounds contain a cation and an anion. So, A element, uh, that's A reactant, that's for the first elemental form. So, A, it is basically an element. And it is, it is being uh, forced to react with a compound. And this compound has to be, and remember, so generally, it's, it's very clear to understand if it's an aqueous state, but it's slightly difficult if both of them are taken in the solid states, and then we need to provide energy in terms of heat or, or any other supply, energy sources in order to observe the changeover. Now, so A reactant plus BC, that's also a reactant, and after that, it forms AC, that's a product, and B, and the product. That's be that's basically or that symbolizes that A is more powerful, more powerful than B, and is able to displace since A is more powerful, more active, it is able to displace B from its compound B C, and to take its position. And B separated out as an element. 
So that's what we call as displacement reaction. So iron plus copper sulfate gives ferrous sulfate plus copper, where iron, if, if, if you follow the metal activity series, iron is much more reactive than, or active rather, for, uh, with respect to copper sulfate or copper. And hence, iron displaces copper to form copper ferrous sulfate. Potassium bromide plus chlorine gives KCl plus uh, Br2, but bromine. Chlorine is more reactive, more active than bromine, and hence it's able to displace bromine to take its position from KCl or potassium chloride solution. Now we'll move on to our next set of reaction. That's why we call as double displacement or decomposition reaction. Rather, it's better to say double, it's not it's double displacement. And it's not a general decomposition reaction. It's a general, it's a basically a word, it's, it became short. The first word is actually correct, double decomposition reaction. It's a small word missing over here. It has to be double decomposition reaction or double displacement reaction. So as, since I wrote, I wrote this one in a one single straight line, for that reason, the word got basically, maybe it's, it's having a merge over there, it's somewhere else. So it's basically double decomposition reaction or double displacement reaction. It's not general only, it's not an only displacement reaction, sorry, only decomposition reaction. The previously, if you check out the list of reactions given over there, this, uh, the, uh, before we started with the discussion, the individual reactions in a more detailed and a specific way, we discussed, we given on the list over there where displacement reaction or decom double decomposition reaction or double displacement reaction, that name has been mentioned over there. So here, particularly here, where is this a small, small printing mistake or the typing or error is over there. So I need to worry. This is not general. It's, it's not decomposition is having a double. It's not, not that. Decomposition reaction is not having the name of double displacement. It's basically double decomposition reaction. This particular thing is double decomposition reaction, also known as double displacement reaction. So if we go over the statement or the description of this particular reaction, we will say that when two or more substances exchanges their ions with each other in aqueous state in order from their compounds. So previously in the, in the displacement reaction, we saw that one general thing that is uh, one, one element is reacting with a compound. One element is reacting with a compound. Now, so if we, uh, if, if we compare and if you see the progress, that's, we started with a simple displacement reaction. So we started with a combination reaction where two elements combine. Or maybe compound or an element is combining with each other to form a new particular compound. Next, we went on to decomposition. So first, two things are combining to form one product. So two or more reactants are combining to form one product. And then in the very next reaction, one product is decomposing or breaking into one or two, or decomposing into two or more substances or compounds. The third, we are having displacement where one element reacts with a compound and the one which is more reactive displaces the less reactive one to form a saw to form a compound and over here we are having double decomposition reaction with double displacement reaction where uh, two different compounds will react with each other and definitely in aqueous state two different uh, 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 compounds or salts will react or let's focus as compounds only the two different compounds will react with each other in the aqueous state in order in aqueous state and in order to form new compounds where exchange of ions take place so there is no point there is no point of thinking that about the metal activity series anymore because this double for this double decal displacement reaction or double decomposition reaction metal activity series is not so much important or not so much uh, rather uh, uh, valid so coming on to some of the examples of this particular double displacement of the decomposition reaction, that is, we're having this general formula, the structure, that's AB reactant plus CD reactant with AD plus BC. If you check it out, that AB is a compound, CD is also compound, and A and a, a, a gets merged with D, and B gets attached to C. So there's an exchange of ions taking place. It's an exchange of ions within each other. So a compound is having one cation and one anion. Another compound is also having a cation and an ion. And in the reactors, when they're mixed, they actually exchange their ions to form a, another new set of products. So we are having ferrous sulfate so in the aqueous states and ammonium hydroxide that's also aqueous. So we're having ferrous hydroxide and ammonium sulfate. 
We were having sodium chloride reaction and uh, lead nitrate also. So sodium chloride aqueous and lead nitrate also in the aqueous state, we were having sodium nitrate and lead chloride. So if you focus on those reactions, it's a general, a practical reaction. So we focus on, we'll see that iron, now it's taking over, it's replacing ammonium to form uh, ferrous hydroxide. And same simultaneously, ammonium is, uh, we can consider that ammonium, this is replacing iron to form ammonium sulfate. So over here is this, this particular, uh, um, which is more reactive uh, cation, which is more reactive element, and based on the metal activity series, it's, decomposition, it's double displacement, double decomposition reaction, it does not consider, it does not take them care of. So just a general reaction, but exchange of ions take place. All right? Now, since a lot of reactions we are focusing on, a lot of the reactants are focusing on, uh, we, whether we have seen a gradual change over with the elements and compounds and interaction with, with you know, elements and compounds and two between two compounds. But we didn't consider, we didn't uh, pay too much uh, highlighted, uh, you know, too much uh, attention over the energy transfer, the energy exchanges that's taking place during the course of the chemical reaction. And based on this particular energy exchange of the current or the energy transfer or the, or the liberation of energy during the course of a chemical reaction, this also guides, or this also classifies reactions under two, two broader categories, that is endothermic reaction and exothermic reactions. So it started, we were focusing, we are starting with a, there are another few examples, two more, a couple of more reactions that we could focus on. That's what we, what, what, what we call as exothermic reaction and exothermic reaction first on as the as, as the discussion will be proceed we'll focus on endothermic also so this exothermic this word means exo means to liberate out exo means out this word exo means out and the word thermic which comes from the word therm which means heat so heat out heat out from what from where from a reaction so exothermic reaction exo means out therm means heat so heat out from a reaction. That's what we call as exothermic reaction. So reactions in which heat energy is liberated in considerable amounts is one of the product that we call as exothermic reaction. So if we have to take a considerable example, that's water, the CaO that's basically quicklime plus water will get calcium hydroxide plus heat. This reaction is very common and very uh, you can also do it. That is, you, you, you can visit any of those uh, shops, uh, the, uh, any, any of those paint shops in their in, in the locality and ask for, and, uh, and, and, and ask for quick line, and ask for normal line or quick line. Uh, so you'll get, you'll get this calcium oxide, the solid form, white. And bring it down, bring it in back to home, and you just add a little bit of water over there. We'll see, in, in, in the container, you keep that one. You can take a certain amount of water, and you add that quick lime over there, you'll see that it's releasing heat. The entire container will be very hot. Very, very, it will uh, gradually it, it will become hot. The next we're having iron plus oxygen is basically uh, um, the formation of ferric oxide, the heat, that's as well, or what we call as, uh, it, it liberates heat. So for uh, iron oxide is, this basically we're not generally heating, but this, uh, this reaction is quite common when you're, when during the course of a rust formation, and also in the normal course when iron reacts generally with oxygen, it forms ferrous oxide, but though grad though, there are certain reactions where sometimes we need to give energy, but after a certain point of time, the, and since the energy reacts or the energy liberates its energy of exothermic reaction, we need to we, we, we can stop the course of supplying the energy source and the heat energy liberated during the course of a reaction that only governs and channelizes the reaction, proceed the reaction further. Moving on to the next, that is endothermic reaction. Endo means absorb. Endo means in. This word endo means within, inside. Absorb, inside, in. So the word endo means in. Exo means out, endo means in. So in, heat in. So heat within the reaction. So inside the reaction, that's heat. So requirement of heat inside. So heat within the system. That's what you call as with a reaction also, that's what you call as endothermic reaction. So in simple reactions in which heat energy is absorbed in considerable amount in order to initiate the reaction. Initiate means to start the reaction, that's what you call as endothermic reaction. So nitrogen plus oxygen plus heat is on the, it's a very fantastic, fantastic example, it's almost 3000 degrees Celsius temperature is required 
to form nitric oxide. And this reaction is common in our atmospheres during the lightning time. During the lightning time, that the, the temperature increases. During the, so we have observed a high temperature uh, during the lightning time. And what happened during that time, that it creates a high temperature. During the, uh, if, uh, you know, if you know that the, ten, the lightning time, the temperature goes out to almost around 5,000 degrees Celsius. Okay. So the temperature reaches around 5,000 degrees Celsius, and uh, under such temperature, nitrogen gets converted into reactive oxygen to form nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide you know, it, it further gets oxidized. The nitric oxide is not very stale, it, it's, uh, so it, rea it gets oxidized to form the reactive oxygen further to form nitrogen dioxide, which, when dis which gets dissolved in water because nitrogen dioxide is a highly water soluble gas. So it gets dissolved in the water. Uh, available, that's uh, the moisture which is available, and uh, during the rain, and if it rains, also it gets dissolved and comes down in the salt for in the form of nitrates. So, further nitrates within the soil, it's being absorbed by the plant roots, and they get the nitrogen requirement. They're fulfilling their nitrogen for the required for the body. That's what you call as endothermic reaction. That's another one called co co coke plus. Oxygen, for example, we need to supply heat. That's why that's what we call as carbon dioxide and endothermic reaction. Now, moving further, we'll discuss some more, a few more reactions, definitely. But another that is very important reaction is what we call as precipitation reaction. The word precipitation means anything which, uh, in the word, in the word of chemistry, precipitation is one insoluble substance is formed. It's basically a reaction. The precipitation is a process. It comes from the word precipitate. So anything which precipitates, that's what you call as. So anything which precipitates or in a reaction, if a, any a substance, if it gets precipitated, then it is what you call as. So precipitate is the actual substance, what you what, what call it that. But if the process is called a precipitation. Now, the substance, the process by which any substance is getting precipitated, it's called precipitation reaction. So, reactions in which at least one insoluble substance is formed is one of the product of the liquid medium. So, liquid precipitation reaction on liquid medium is very, very important. This medium liquid is very, very important. It's very important. Precipitation reaction. All right. So reactions in which at least one insoluble solid substance is formed as one of the products within the liquid reaction medium. That's what we call as pre precipitation reaction. All right. So we need to focus on the examples. We will, we, will, we will understand this much better, in a much better way. We're having calcium chloride plus sodium sulfate. So calcium sulfate is a precipitated, uh, it's, it's, it's getting precipitated from the reaction medium. So calcium chloride, which I didn't mention over here, that's, you should mention. Though I haven't mentioned over here, but you should mention. It's mentioned, basically it's mentioned in the reaction three. It's mentioned in reaction number three. You can check it out, all are aqueous. So same, same thing over here is calcium chloride AQ. You should write mention over there AQ. Since in the definition it's written a real liquid reaction medium. So over there, it's mentioned liquid reaction medium, so I, I, it's better to mention calcium chloride CaCl2 in bracket AQ. It's, you can check it out, the third reaction 3, the word there is mentioned AQ. So aqueous, the calcium chloride aqueous, sodium sulfate aqueous, giving calcium sulfate white. It's a white precipitate. Calcium sulfate, it's a white precipitate. Precipitating, uh, precipitating out and from the system, and sodium chloride, which is also in the aqueous state. We're having ferrous sulfate plus ammonium hydroxide. Being ferrous hydroxide, it's dirty cream plus ammonium sulfate. That's also ferrous sulfate, ammonium sulfate, that's also in the aqueous state, ammonium hydroxide aqueous, ferrous sulfate aqueous. So if you check, if, if, if you remember, previously we have given this example once previous also, that we were mentioned, oh, there we mentioned about this aqueous, aqueous, ferrous hydroxide, precipitating out, and ammonium sulfate, that's also in the aqueous state. The next we're having this lead nitrate. We are having lead nitrate. Plus Ki giving lead iodide plus potassium nitrate all in the aqueous state of lead iodide is a brilliant yellow precipitate PPT. This inverted sign, this inverted arrow, uh, is basically also the up, upward arrow, so downward arrow. 
It's a downward arrow inverted arrow. It's, well, 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 it's, a, it's a way of representing precipitation. So precip the substance which is getting precipitated out is, is being represented by that particular inverted arrow. Copper solid aqueous for the H2S. It's a gaseous medium that uh, our gas passed through the aqueous solution. will get copper sulfide. It's a black in color and a hydrosalturic acid. Now over here, I've also, uh, basically, I have tried to uh, uh, rather highlight two important, um, uh, two very, very prime important precipitates that if you, it will be easier or rather interesting for you to identify and memorize, that is to the colors of two. The ferrous hydroxide dirty green, the dirty green color looks like this. The dirty green color looks like this. You can see it's a, it's a dirty green. It's not exactly green over there. At the top, it's dirty, turning brown, but red, but the actual color is shown over there. It's, uh, this is what we call, what we call a dirty green. This what we call this color actually what we call a dirty green, and the uh, lead iodide which is yellow in color. This is basically this one, yellow in color. You can check it out. This is lead iodide. How it looks like? It's a beautiful yellow, brilliant, brilliant yellow color. It's a fantastic color. This is what we call as dirty green. Hey, sorry, brilliant. This is this is yellow, brilliant yellow color. This one has dirty green. It's a ferrous hydroxide. You can see in the test tube of the gear given over there, and this one in the very glass bottle is shown over there. It's a yellow. This this is what we. This is how. Let add that looks like it's a brilliant coloration. Now all these things, since we are precipitated, we were discussing we have discussed precipitates also, we have discussed well, our endothermic and exothermic reaction, a lot of reactions we have discussed till now. Now the next another reaction which is very important, but before before proceeding to that particular reaction, we need to understand one important topic. We need to understand that one. We need to we need to uh, rather get we need to have a concept about that particular uh, the background of that particular reaction. And that's why uh, for that reason we need we will we will first learn about oxides of elements. So oxides of elements mean any 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 element along with that the combination of oxygen. So element plus oxygen any element plus oxygen if it gives an, if it's giving a product. It's corresponding, that's what, what, what we call this oxides of elements. Now, oxides of elements are of two types one, metallic oxides, and the one, another one, non metallic oxides. So, oxides of elements are classified the two major headings or banner, which we call as metallic oxides and non metallic oxides. Now, this non metallic, metallic oxides and non metallic oxides both individually can be subdivided into two major heads. Metallic oxides classified as basic oxides and amphoteric oxides. Basic oxides, example given, sodium oxide, potassium oxide, etc. Uh, amphoteric oxides, aluminium oxides, zinc oxide, etc. Non-metallic oxides can be classified into two broad headings. That's what we call as acidic oxides and neutral oxides. So acidic oxides, NO2, SO2, CO2, etc. Neutral oxides, CO, N2, H2O. Etc. Now, what's the definition of what's the definition of basic oxides? Now, if we hold understanding the definition of basic oxides, we need to understand the definition of basic oxides. What is that? We will understand the basic oxides over here. Why they are called basic oxides? Basic oxides are those oxides which, which when dissolved in water will form a base. Okay. So any oxide. Which, which is which when dissolved in water, if it forms a base, then we will classify that one as basic oxide. Similarly, those as oxides which when dissolved in water, it will form an acid. It will form it will form an acid, and we will classify that one as acidic oxide. So we need to classify that if you go. So why the name is basic oxide? The name is basic oxide because which when dissolved any oxides, any oxide, those oxides rather, which when dissolved in water if it form a base, will tell us we will classify that when a group or will group it as uh, will group it as basic oxide. And those oxides which when dissolved in water form an acid, which when dissolved to form uh, and dissolved in water to form an acid, we will classify that one as acidic oxide. The next we are having, we are having. I've shown the over here with one example only. We can you can apply this 
So you, you can apply this with the rest of the exercise which are available. We hear the, the few examples I've given earlier, and you can apply the rest of the examples, which are all the multiple examples of theory. You can apply all these exercises and you can match up. But whether this particular thing is a basic oxide, it's forming a base with water, we react to reaction with water, whether it's forming a base or whether it's forming an acid. If it is forming a base, it's a basic oxide. If it's forming an acid, it's an acid oxide. But if those oxides, which after reacting with a base or an acid, oxides after reacting with a base or reacting with an acid, it forms salt and water. So the same oxide, which when react with an acid, it forms a base salt and water. Same oxide, which when react with a base, it will once again form salt and water only. So such oxides are called amphoteric oxides. Such oxides are called amphoteric oxides. That's a definition of acid, base, and acidic oxide, basic oxide classification. Salt and water. Now, if if we, now if we focus on that, we have already prepared salt. We have already prepared base. We have already prepared an acid. There's an interesting combination. That if what will happen if we combine this, the foreign base and the foreign acid over here, we we'll, we are, we, we are focusing. That we are we are we are for forcing an uh, substance that or rather we are making uh, two substances to react. One is a basic oxide with water, that basically that's a neutral oxide, and uh, we are also forcing we are also mixing that an acidic oxide with neutral oxide, and we are getting an acid, and we are also from the base, and then we we mixed. Two, we are we, we made to react two things or rather two substances. One is well, one we are classifying as amphoteric oxide, it's reacting with the base and reacting with an acid to give solid water. Now, what will happen if a base and an acid react? But over here, because we, because we didn't show this reaction over here, what will happen over there if we, a base and an acid react? If that reacts, such reactions are classified or termed as neutralization reaction. Now, what is neutralization reaction? Reactions in which an acid and a base reacts with a base and an acid. Reactions in which an acid or a base react with a base or an acid to form salt and water as the only products within a liquid reaction mixture. So let's check out the example. I'll consider the example which I just now did. So I've taken the base, sodium hydroxide base, reacts with an acid. It gives sodium chloride plus water. Calcium hydroxide, that's a base, it reacts with an acid. HNO just now I prepared that one in the previous uh, slide I've shown that one. Nitric acid prepared. So an acid reacts with a base to form salt and water. Sulfuric acid in an acid, it reacts with a base. So acid base gives salt and water. Base acid reacts together to form salt and water. So whether it's a com whether the combination is an acid base combination or base acid combination, whatever the combination procedure, it doesn't matter. But if the substance is an acid and another one is a base, the, form, the outcome will be salt and water. And if this is the outcome, if this is the outcome, if they're reacting, if a base is reacting with an acid, it, it will form salt and water. And if it forms salt and water, if it forms salt and water, it's not compulsory every time it forms, it will form salt and water. But if it forms salt and water, we are the only two products, only so acid reacting with the base to form salt and water as the only products, or rather, the only products formed. No more products are informed, extra, no third product. Now, such reactions are called neutralization reaction. Neutralization reaction. Now, focusing on this, standing over here, we will now we need to understand and we need to uh, of, uh, uh, we need to of more focus. Uh, there is one very important question which is we need to uh, by standing over we need to ask what's the important question is that is. What is the pH of a reaction then? Since we are talking, discussing about acid, discussing about base, then what will be the pH of the reaction medium? So first we need to understand what the pH is. The pH is basically, we want to buy a number indicates whether the solution is acidic or basic or neutral. That's basically pH. It's a small p capital H, small p capital H, do not bad number, indicates whether the solution is acidic or basic. It's basically, in simple words, we call as concentration of hydrogen ions. Okay. The amount of hydrogen ions present in a particular reaction medium. So in simple words, pH is basically denoted by number in which the solution is acidic or basic or neutral. How to identify that? The number is basically actually a part of the scale 
color PA scale, it ranges from 0 to 14, there are seven neutral points. So neutral point, that means it's neither acidic, neither basic, it's in the center, in the middle. Now, if you go, if, if you follow this scale, the more we are going to the right, the value increases. So the more, after seven, the more greater, the, so the pH value more than seven, we will consider the such solutions as basic. The pH less than seven, we'll consider this, that one as acidic. So pH solutions having pH less than seven are acidic solutions. Solutions having pH more than seven, that's what we call as basic solutions, sorry, basic solutions are basic solutions, all right. Though here there is an alkalinity, basically alkaline solutions or basic solutions are the same thing, no problem, nothing else, different names. So we are having over here a reaction calcium hydroxide plus nitric acid, giving calcium nitric salt and water. So if the reaction, this, this, is, this reaction we can consider as neutral solution, a neutralization reaction, neutral solution. If, if the pH of this particular reaction is getting us 7, then it's from neutral, the new, it's, it's, it has from neutral solution. But if you are getting the solution is less, pH less than 7, then the solution still can just more acid with respect to the base. And it is, if you are getting amount, to, if you are getting more than 7, if you are getting more than 7, that is, then amount of base is more compared to that of acid. Now, how do you understand that the solution can take as acid or base? Now, this answer is actually given by another compound that we call as indicators. Indicators are chemical compounds which change its color in acidic or basic solution. So the point of neutralization or change in pH, change of pH, we, uh, it's smart pH, smart is identified by the change of color of this chemical. So if the color changes, Depending on the color change, we identify that the solution has become acidic or basic and where the neutral point is. Depending upon the point of, or rather, the, 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 uh, depending upon the color change, we classify as whether the solution is acidic or basic, or which is the neutral point. So the moment it changes its color, the moment, that means it has changed, the pH has changed, either from acidic to basic or basic to acidic. So here, endothermic reaction and exothermic reactions. So it started with, we were focusing, we are starting with a, another few examples, uh, two more, a couple of more reactions that we could focus on. That's what we, what, what, what we call as exothermic reaction. And exothermic reaction, first, on, as, the, as, as the discussion will be proceed, we will focus on endothermic also. So this exothermic, this word means, exo means to liberate out. Exo means out. This word exo means out. And the word thermic, which comes from the word therm, which means heat. So heat out. Heat out from where? From where? From a reaction. So exothermic reaction. Exo means out. Therm means heat. So heat out from a reaction. That's what we call as exothermic reaction. So reactions in which heat energy is liberated in considerable amounts is one of the product that we call as exothermic reaction. So if we are taking a consider an example, that's water, the CaO that's basically quicklime plus water will get calcium hydroxide plus heat. This reaction is very common and very, uh, you can also do it. That is, you, you, you can visit any of those uh, shops. Now, the series also gives the information about which metal is capable of replacing another metal from its compound to form a new compound. This particular metal activity series gives, a, it, it's, it's a very vital and vital information which is very required and highly required. Whenever we are carrying out a chemical reaction, there is which metal is reactive towards other substances. Let's go take an example. That if you're considering, if you're if you're using silver, and we are, if you want that silver to react with copper sulfate solution, it will not react easily. If you want to react.